Good evening. This is Orson Welles. Craig's wife, which is the title of tonight's offering, has been a personal enthusiasm since I first saw it. This story of 24 hours in the life of a husband and wife. As we've rehearsed it here in the studio, we've been impressed to find that Craig's wife is fresh and vital and true in the same degree as it was when it first played on Broadway. Got the Pulitzer Prize. Miss Faye Bainter, who was to have played Mrs. Craig, is unfortunately one of the many victims of our local epidemic of flu. In her stead, we are something more than lucky in the very personable person of an actress distinguished both in motion pictures and in the living theater, whose triumphs have been memorable in both fields and richly deserved, Miss Anne Harding. Mrs. Harold! Mrs. Harold! Well, Maisie, what is it now? Did you see the evening paper? Who? What? It's a murder right over near us, too, on Willows Avenue. For land's sake, I used to work over on Willows Avenue. Who was it? Fashionable Willows residence, scene of double tragedy. Bodies of J. Fergus Pasmore and wife, socially prominent in this city, found dead in library from bullet wounds. land's sakes. Empty revolver near fireplace, cause of death shrouded in mystery. Police working upon identity of gentleman visitors seen leaving premises in automobile shortly after midnight. Here's me the creeps it does. Well, creeps and hooks. You better brush up them rose petals from off the living room floor. And don't leave the evening paper lying about either. You're not expecting the lady back already, are you? Can't ever tell about women like Mrs. Craig. If she gets an idea that there's a pin out of place around here, she'll take the first train out of Albany and come right back home. Honest, Mrs. Harold. I never worked for a woman like Mrs. Craig. Sure feel sorry for Mr. Craig. Oh, she could build a nest in that man's ear and he'd never know it. She certainly is the hardest woman to please I ever worked for. Did you, did I tell you about her wanting me to dust the leaves off that little tree in front of the dining room window last week? Dust the leaves? That's the honest truth, and me with rheumatism at the time. You know how I done it, don't you? What'd you say to her? I told her right up. I said, I'll dust no tree for nobody. No, you turned her eye. She says, you mean you refuse to dust it? Yes, I says, I refuse, and what's more, I'm going to stay refused. Well, she says, it needs dusting whether you dust it or not. Well, I says, let it need it. A little dust won't poison it. We'll be dust ourselves someday unless we get drowned. <laughs> you sure done right. I think the worst kind of woman a girl can work for is one that's crazy about her house. Say, how long is she going to be away in Albany? Well, I guess till her sister's better, but still you never know about her. She's liable to find some excuse to come home. She don't like to be away from her home. Mrs. Craig don't. All right, dear. Just leave your bags here. That's Harold. Mrs. Craig. Mrs. Harold? Mrs. Harold? Coming. Coming. Maybe? Yes, Mrs. Craig. Oh, good afternoon, Mrs. Craig. We didn't expect you back so soon. Uh, good afternoon, Mrs. Craig. This is Miss Eldreth, my niece, Mrs. Harold. Uh, Maisie, will you take her things up to the corner room? She's staying with us for a few days. Yes, Mrs. Craig. And uh, will you see that that catch is on the screen door, Mrs. Harold? It was half open when I came in. Yes, Mrs. Craig. Aunt Harriet, are you sure we were right to leave Mother like that? Oh, Ethel, dear, you mustn't start that. Your mother's been through this very same kind of thing many times before. Be careful with that suitcase, Maisie. Don't scratch the wall. Oh, Aunt Harriet. Yes, dear? Suppose something should happen. Oh, nothing's going to happen, dear child. Mrs. Harold. Uh, Miss Harold? Yes, Mrs. Craig. Where did those roses come from? Uh, why, that woman across the street brought them over to your aunt. Mrs. Fraser, you mean? Yes, ma'am. Well, you better take them out of here, Mrs. Harold. The petals will be all over the room. Maybe Miss Austin left them in her room. She and Mrs. Fraser are up there having tea. Do you mean to tell me that Mrs. Fraser is upstairs in my aunt's room? Yes, ma'am. And how did she happen to get up there? Miss Austin asked her. Really? Oh. All right, that, that will be all, Mrs. Harold. Aunt Harriet. Yes? You know, there was something I wanted to tell Mother, but the doctor said he thought I'd better wait. Is it something important? Yes, it was about Professor Fredericks at school. Mother met him last year when she was up there at commencement, and she liked him very much. And when we got home, she said that if he ever said anything to me... She'd be glad if I could like him well enough to marry him. She said she'd feel easier about me in case anything ever happened to her. And you mean he has said something? Yes. He asked me to marry him right after Easter. I don't know why your mother would be so panicky about your future, Ethel. You're only 19. She said she'd like to feel that I have somebody. Well, why does a person need anybody, dear, if one has money enough to get along on? Oh, really, I think you're a very foolish girl, Ethel, if you rush into marriage. Oh, but Aunt Harriet, if he and I are... Are you engaged to this, this Mr... Um... Uh, Mr. Fredericks. Yes, I am, Aunt Harriet. I knew Mother liked him, so when he asked me... Well, that's all very nice, Ethel, but simply liking a man isn't going to go very far toward keeping things going. But... Well, I have money of my own, Aunt Harry. Oh, I know that, dear child, but surely he isn't marrying you because of it. Oh, no, of course not. He doesn't know anything about that. Well, hope not. You did say he was a professor, didn't you, dear? He's a professor of romance languages. Naturally. <laughs> and I suppose he told you that he loves you in all of them. Were you married, Aunt Harriet? I had no private fortune like yours, Ethel. I married to be on my own in every sense of the word. I haven't entirely achieved the condition yet, but I know it can be done. I don't quite understand what you mean, Aunt Harry. Well, I mean that I'm simply exacting my share of a bargain. Oh. 
by securing into my own hands the control of the man upon which they're founded. But how are you ever going to do a thing like that, Aunt Harriet? Haven't you ever gotten Mr. Fredericks to do something you wanted him to do? <laughs> yes, but I always told him I wanted him to do it. Well, there are certain things that men can't be told, Ethel. They don't understand them, particularly romantic men. And Mr. Craig is, is inveterately idealistic. But supposing he would find out sometime? Find out what? Well, what you've been telling me, that, that you want to control him. Oh, one never comprehends, dear, but it is not in one's nature to comprehend. That's where we women have such a tremendous advantage over men. Oh, I know you're deploring my lack of nobility. Oh, no, I'm not at all, Aunt Harriet. Yes, you are. See it in your face. You think I'm a very sordid woman. Oh, no, I don't think anything of the kind. Well, what do you think? Well, frankly, Aunt Harriet, I, I don't think it's quite honest. It's very much safer, dear, for everybody. Because, as I say, if a woman is the right kind of a woman, it's better that the destiny of her home should be in her hands than in any man's, don't you see? Aunt Harriet, I'm rather tired. Would you mind if I rested a bit? Oh, of course not, child. You go right upstairs. I'll be along in a few minutes to see that you're comfortable. Mrs. Harrow. Mrs. Harrow. Yes, Mrs. Craig. Uh, have there been any letters or messages for me since I've been away? Uh, two letters, ma'am. One came this morning and one came Tuesday. No telephone calls? None for you, ma'am. There was a gentleman called Mr. Craig this afternoon, about four o'clock. He seemed real anxious to get in touch with Mr. Craig and for him to call him as soon as he came in. And who was that? Uh, Mr. Bergmeyer, ma'am. He was the same gentleman that called Mr. Craig last night. But he must have got in touch with him, for I gave him the number Mr. Craig said he'd be at. You mean Mr. Craig was out last night? Uh, where? I don't know, ma'am. He didn't say. But he left a number for me to give anybody if they call. I wrote it down in this paper so I wouldn't forget it. It was 11. Levering 3100. Levering 3100. He didn't say whose number it was. No, ma'am. He just left the number and the gentleman called and I gave it to him like he told me. I see. All right, Mrs. Harold. I'll, I'll tell him when he comes. Yes, ma'am. Information? Uh, could you give me the address of the telephone number Levering 3100? Oh, you don't give out addresses. I see. Well, it isn't important. Thank you very much. Who's here, bright and smiling? Hello, Walter. Harriet. Would you get in, my dear? A few minutes ago, left Albany at noon. Aren't you wire or something? All I right, never thought of it, to tell you the truth. <laughs> there was so much to be done around there, getting Ethel's things together, and one thing and another. Was Ethel there? Yes, I brought her back with me. She's upstairs, lying down. How's your sister? Why, I couldn't see that there was anything the matter with her more than usual. But you'd think from her letter she was dying. Then I'd have to walk out and leave my house for a whole week and go mm. racing up to Albany. Glad to have you back again, Harriet. Oh, stop it, Walter. You're so strong. <laughs> Seems you've been away a month instead of a week. Don't break my bones, Walter. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I think I'd like to do sometimes. <laughs> now, stop it. Stop it. Here, take this hat and put it there where it belongs. Okay. Uh, take this paper out of here, too. This room's a sight. Your aunt's company will be scandalized. Oh, has Auntie Orson got some company? She's upstairs with her. The, um... Woman across the street there. Mrs. Frazier? Hey, it's a wonder she wouldn't bring a few of those roses over here, Auntie Austin. I guess she has sense enough to know that if we wanted roses, we could plant some. Walter, whose telephone number is Levering 3100? That's Berg Fassmore. Why? Oh, nothing. I was just wondering. Uh, Miss Harrow told me you gave her that number last night in case anybody wanted you. I was wondering where it was. Berg is past I was playing cards out there last night. What did Billy Berkmeyer want you for? Mrs. Harold said he called you out. Yeah, Fergus asked him, too, but Billy called me up later to tell me that his father just came in from St. Louis. He wouldn't be able to make it. I wasn't here when he called, so we talked to him from there. I hope you're not going to get into that card playing again, Walter. Hey, never gave up card playing. We haven't played in nearly a year. Well, I suppose that's because you don't play, and most of the folks know that, so they don't ask me. Was Fergus' wife there? No. I suppose that's the reason Fergus asked you then, wasn't it? What do you mean? Well, you're not insanely jealous of her, oh. Sure, he's never jealous of me. He was jealous of everybody, from what I could see. Oh, don't be silly, Harriet. But you wouldn't know it, Walter, even if you were. I'm glad I wouldn't. You come to find out, I'll bet that's just the reason Billy Berkmeyer dodged it. That that's just what he called you up to tell you. He called me up to tell me anything of the kind, Harriet. He simply called me up to tell me his father had come in unexpectedly from Oh, same... I don't mean last night. I mean when he called you today. He didn't call today. Yes, he did, this afternoon, four o'clock. Here? So Mrs. Harold told me. Said he wanted you to get in touch with him as soon as oh, you came in. I wonder in. why he didn't call the office. Well, probably did, and you'd gone. Really, Walter, I can't understand Auntie Austin. The minute my back is turned, she invites one of the neighbors into my house. Well, why shouldn't she, Harriet? Why shouldn't she? Well, really, Walter, she stands there right out on the front porch saying goodbye oh, to that Harriet. Mrs. Frazier. You say Ethel's here? Yes, she's in the guest room. I think I'll go up and say hello to her. Goodbye, dear. I'll be right down. Bye. Oh, hello, Harriet. How did you find your sister? Mrs. Harold told me a moment ago that you were back. Yes, Auntie Austin, I'm back. I think it's about time I came back, don't you? I don't understand what you mean. Well, from the looks of things, if I stayed away much longer, I should probably have come back to find my house a thoroughfare for the entire neighborhood. You mean my having Mrs. Frazier here for tea? 
You know perfectly well what I mean, Auntie Austin. Please don't try to appear so innocent. It's exactly what that woman's been trying to do ever since we've been here. And the minute you get my back turned, you let her succeed. Just for the sake of a lot of small talk, how did she happen to get in here? She brought me some roses over, which I think was very thoughtful of. Of course. And you walk right into the trap. Well... Why do you think she should be so anxious to get in here, Harriet? For the same reason that a lot of other women in this neighborhood want to get in here. To satisfy their vulgar curiosity. See what they can see. And why should you care if they do see? I don't want a lot of idle neighbors on visiting terms. Let them tend to their houses. They'll have plenty to do. Mrs. Fraser is very likely one of those housekeepers that hides the dirt in the corners with a bunch of roses. You know nothing about her house. Well, I don't want to know about it. And I don't want to know about her. She wasn't here to see you. She was in my house, wasn't she? And in your husband's house? Oh, well, she was hardly here to see my husband, was she? Mrs. Fraser was here to see me, your husband's aunt. And I made her welcome, and so did he. And asked her to come back again. And I don't think you'd find him very much in accord with your attitude if he knew of it. Well, you'll probably tell him. Oh, I have a lot of things to tell him, Harriet. I've had plenty of time to think about them during the past two years up there in my room. And they've been particularly clear to me this week that you've been away. That's why I've decided to tell Walter, because I think he should be told. Only I want you to be here when I tell you, so that you won't be able to twist what I say. You have a very good opinion of me, haven't you, Auntie Austin? It's not an opinion I have of you at all, Harriet. It's you that I have. Well, whatever it is, I'm not at all interested in hearing about it. I want you to know that I resent intensely your having brought Mrs. Fraser in here. Oh, be honest about it, at least, Harriet. But what do you mean? Why well, particularize on Mrs. Fraser? Because I don't want her here. You don't want anybody here. I don't want her. You don't want your husband. Only that he's necessary to the upkeep here. But if you could see how that could be changed or managed without him, his position here would be as pure as, as the position of one of those pillows there. Well, I must say, Miss Austin, that's a very nice thing for you to say to me. You want your house, Harriet. And that's all you do want. And that's all you'll have to finish, unless you change your way. People who live to themselves, Harriet, are generally left to themselves. For other people will not go on being made miserable indefinitely for the sake of your ridiculous idolatry of house furnishings. You seem to have borne it rather successfully. I did it for Walter's sake. Because I knew he wanted to have me here. I didn't want to make it difficult. But I've been practically a recluse in that room of mine upstairs ever since you've been here. Just to avoid scratching that holy staircase or leaving a print on one of those sacred rugs. I'm not used to that kind of stupidity. I'm accustomed to living in rooms. I think too much of myself to consider their appearance where my comfort is concerned. So I've decided to make a change. Only I want my reasons to be made perfectly clear to Walter before I go. I think I owe it to him for his own hey, sake hey, as well too. as mine. What's the matter? Upstairs. Haven't the faintest idea, I'm sure. But from what Auntie Austin has just been saying, she seems to think there are quite a few things the matter. What is it, Auntie? She tells me she's going to leave us. Nothing what? very new, Walter. To leave the house, you mean? So she says. You didn't say that, did you, Auntie? Haven't I just told you she said it? I'm leaving tomorrow, Walter. But why? What's happened? She says she finds my conduct of affairs here unendurable. I'll be obliged to you, Harriet. If you'll allow me to explain the reasons for my going, I know them better than you do. But you haven't any reasons that I can see. Except the usual jealous reasons that women have of the wives of men that they've brought up. You'll have plenty of time to give your version of my leaving after I'm gone. Well, sit down then and let us hear your version of it. I prefer to stand, thank you. As you please. I doubt if I'd um, know quite how to sit in one of these chairs. What do you mean, Auntie? I can't believe you've had a difficulty with anyone, especially with Harriet, who thinks the world of you. Now, you know she does, Auntie. Harriet's just as fond of you as I am. I'm glad you're here to hear some of this. I suppose there are little irritations that come up around a house occasionally, just as there are in any other business. But I'm sure you're too sensible, Auntie, to allow them to affect you to the extent of making you want to, to leave the house. Why, Auntie, what did we do here around you without you? It wouldn't seem to me that we had any house at all. What was it you said to Auntie, Harriet? I said anything to her, of course. She's simply using her imagination. Well... If it isn't anything that Harriet has said to you, Annie, what is it? Oh, no. Harriet has never said anything. She simply acts and leaves you to interpret, if you're able. It takes a long time to be able until you find the key. It's all very simple, very ridiculous, and incredibly selfish. So much so, Walter, that I rather despair of ever convincing you of my, of my justification for leaving your house. Well, what has Harriet done, Auntie? I'll tell you what I did, Walter. I objected to Auntie Austin's having brought that woman across the street in here while I was away. You mean Mrs. Fraser? Yes, I mean Mrs. Fraser. What's the matter with Mrs. Fraser? She's a vulgar old busybody. That's what's the matter with her. She's been trying to get in here ever since we've been here. What do you mean she's been trying to get in here? Well, you wouldn't understand if I told you, Walter. It's it's a a form of curiosity that women have about other women's houses that men can't appreciate. I'm afraid I don't quite understand it. 
If you feel anti You're a man, Walter. You're in love with your wife. I'm perfectly familiar with the usual result of interference under those circumstances. Well, I hope I'm open to conviction, Auntie, if you have a grievance. Oh, it isn't my own cause I'm about to plead. It doesn't matter about me. I can't be here. But I don't want to be witness to the undoing of a man by way of becoming a very important citizen without warning him of the danger. I don't understand what you mean, Auntie. It's probably the great part of the danger, Walter, that you don't understand. If you did, it'd be scarcely necessary to warn you. Of what? Your wife. Oh. <laughs> what are you laughing at, Harriet? Oh. oh, don't you think that's very amusing? I don't know that I think it's so very amusing. <laughs> no, I didn't, Harriet. Well, wait till you've heard the rest of it. You'll probably change your mind. Harriet isn't really <laughs> laughing, Walter. What am I doing, crying? You're whistling in the dark. Oh, dear. You're terrified that your secret's been discovered. Really? What is my secret? I think it's hardly necessary to tell you that, Harriet. But I'm interested in hearing it. Well, you can listen while I tell it to Walter. Very well. But I want you to know before I tell him that it didn't remain for your outburst against Mrs. Fraser here a few minutes ago to reveal it to me. I knew it almost as soon as Walter's mother knew it. She means that I've been trying to poison you secretly, Walter. Not so secretly either, Harriet. Well, I'm sorry, I must go. I don't intend to stay. I didn't think you would. Why not, Harriet? Because I have something more important to do than listening to a lot of absurdities. I hope when you finish discussing me, you'll be as frank in letting Walter know something of what I've been putting up with during the past two years. Oh, Harriet. Playing the martyr as usual. I could have almost spoken those last words for her, Walter. I know her so well. I wish you'd tell me what's happened, Auntie. Walter, your mother asked you to promise her when she was dying that you'd take me with you when you married. She asked me to promise her that I'd accept your invitation when you made it. You see, she knew her woman, Walter. The woman you were going to marry. Mother didn't like Harriet? Nobody could like Harriet, Walter. She doesn't want them to. I like her. You're blinded by a pretty face, son. As many another man has been blinded. What's Harriet done? She's left you practically friendless, Walter. Why do you suppose your friends have so suddenly stopped visiting you? They always visited you at home. And I dare say all those charming young men and women that used to have such pleasant times at home thought that when you married, your house would be quite a rendezvous. But they reckoned without their hostess, Walter. Just as they're beginning to reckon without you. You never go out anymore. Nobody ever asks you. They're afraid you might bring her and they don't want her. Because she's made it perfectly clear to them that she doesn't want them. I don't think that's true. No, I, Andy, I think just... I want to tell you Harriet... something that I saw the other day in the city. I was having luncheon at the colonnade, and two of your old Thursday night poker crowd came in, sat at the table within, well, within hearing distance of me. Presently, a man and his wife came in, sat down at another table. The wife immediately proceeded to tell the man how he should have sat down, and how he should sit now that he was down and so on. I distinctly heard one of your friends say to the other, listen to Craig's wife over there. That's a little straw, Walter, that should show you the way the wind is blowing. Your friends resent being told where they shall sit and how, and so they're avoiding the occasion of it, just as I'm going to avoid it. But you can't avoid it, so you must deal with it. How? How should I deal with it? By impressing your wife with the realization that, well, that there's a man in the house, as well as a woman, and that you are that man. If you don't, Walter... You're going to go the way of every other man that's ever allowed himself to be, to be dominated by a selfish woman, become a pallid little echo of her distorted opinions, believing finally that every friend you ever had before you met her was trying to lead you into perdition, and that she rescued you and made a man of you. Oh, Harry can never turn me against my friends. Walter, they can make men believe that the mothers that nursed them are their arch enemies. That's why I'm warning you. For you're fighting for the life of your manhood, Walter. And I can't leave this house without at least turning on the light here and letting you see what it is that you're fighting against. Daddy, I can't see you leave this house. That's all there is but to if it. I'm, but if I'm not happy here... I promised, Mother, that you'd always have a home with me, and if you go, I'll feel somehow that I'm breaking that promise. You haven't a home to offer me, Walter. You have a house with furniture in it. It'll only be used under highly specified conditions. Do you know, I have the impression somehow or other, when I look at these rooms, that they're rooms that have died and are laid out. Well, whenever they are, they'll seem less if you leave them. I don't think I'd feel worse if it were Mother herself that were leaving. Oh, be glad that it wasn't your mother, Walter. She would have left long ago. Beg pardon, Mr. Craig, but there's nothing here to see Ask you. him to come in. I'll see you before I go, Walter. All right. There's a lot of things to be here. Hello, Miss Austin. Oh, hello, Mr. Hello, Walter. Hello, I called your house. I couldn't get you. What's up? Something wrong? Something wrong? Well, that's what I came to see you about. You were out there last night. What are you talking about? You mean you don't know? Haven't you read the evening papers? Fergus Passmore and his wife are dead. What? Both of them murdered. What? I've seen every paper in town. That's why I wanted to see you. 
The paper says they're looking for a man seen leaving the house after midnight. Sure, that was me, but Fergus was alone when I left him. Now, now, listen, Weber. You've got to move carefully in a thing like this. This kind of affair is pie for the newspapers, and the fact that we were invited out there to play cards wouldn't read any too well. I never thought of that, but you've got nothing to worry about. You weren't there. Well, I know that, but I'm not sitting back in the corner in this thing, you know, Walter. It just so happened that I wasn't out there, but I talked to you on the telephone out there last night from my house. And in a thing of this kind, they trace telephone calls and everything else. Oh. Now, now, Waller, I think the wise move for us is just to hop out there and try and find out what's going on. We've got to move mighty carefully, you yeah, know. Yeah, I know. I can't get over it, Billy. Just a few hours ago, I was sitting in his house playing cards with him. He's laughing and joking. You know the way Ferguson is when he's in a card game. No. Hey, Billy, I'm just beginning to realize that I was the last man to see Fergus Passmore alive. Oh, don't I know it. And that's what the police are looking for. You. Come on, now. Let's get going. All right. My car's out front. We hurry. We can get over there in ten minutes. Walter. Walter. Walter, where are you? Walter. Oh, Mrs. Harold. Maisie. Yes, Mrs. Craig. Maisie, where's Mr. Craig? I don't know, Miss. Maybe he went out with that gentleman that was here a while ago. What gentleman? Who was he? I don't know, ma'am. I never saw him before. You're sure he's not around somewhere? I haven't seen him, ma'am. It... Oh, you've been reading the paper. Ain't that a terrible murder, ma'am? I was just saying to Mrs. Harold... I Harold, don't want I... to talk about it, Maisie. Did you know the man? The Passmores, I mean? Oh, be quiet, Maisie. Leave me alone. Oh, yes, ma'am. Oh, why did I ever leave this house? You are listening to the Campbell Playhouse presentation of Craig's Wife, starring Orson Welles and Anne Harding. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Maisie, go up and see that Miss Elder's door is closed and be quiet about it, Maisie. And uh, don't disturb her, she's asleep. Hello? Yes, this is Mrs. Craig's residence. Yes. Oh, yes, Mr. Fredericks. Well, Ethel is lying down now. She was very tired, poor child. No, no, there's nothing really you could do if you came down, Mr. Fredericks. Well, I'd much rather not call her, Mr. Fredericks, if you don't mind. Can't I take the message? Oh, I see, of course, yes, I understand. Oh, no, no, I, I wouldn't think of disturbing her just now. I'm sorry, no, Mr. Fredericks. Mr. Craig. Uh, he says he's from the police headquarters. Police. Show him in and tell him I'll be right down. Will you uh, step this way, please, mister? Mrs. Craig will be right in. Thank you. Good evening. I called to see Mr. Craig. Oh, Mr. Craig isn't in just now. I'm sorry. Have you any idea what time Mr. Craig will be in? I'm expecting him any minute. He was here less than half an hour ago, and I went upstairs, so he must be right here in the neighborhood somewhere. I see. He'll certainly be back for his dinner at 7 o'clock, if you'd care to call back. Well, it may be that you could give me the information I'm looking for, as well as Mr. Craig. But would you sit down for a minute? Oh, certainly. Well, I'll tell you what it is I wanted to see him about, Mrs. Craig. I suppose you've seen the evening paper about this unfortunate affair out here on Willows Avenue. You mean that shooting affair? Yes, at the Passmore home. Isn't that a dreadful thing? I've just been reading it. I'd want to alarm you, Mrs. Craig. There's no particular connection between that and my visit here. Oh, I'm very glad to know that. There was a man seen leaving the Passmore house shortly after midnight in an automobile. One of the neighbors happened to see him, but it was too dark to establish any identification. Besides, that wouldn't account for the death of Mrs. Passmore. Of course, she didn't get in until after 3 o'clock, and the man left there between 12 and 1. I see. Of course, as you understand, Mrs. Craig, it's part of our business to follow up any little outside clue that we happen to get hold of that might throw some additional light on case. Yes, of course. And uh, that's what I wanted to see Mr. Craig about. You mean, uh... You think Mr. Craig might be the man that was seen leaving there last night? No, that circumstance is really not being seriously considered. House of that description might have had any number of visitors during the evening. That's very true. But we've had a report late this afternoon, Mrs. Craig, from the Lindbrook Telephone Exchange, where your calls come in, that there was a call made on your telephone here at 527 this evening, about 30 minutes ago, asking for the address of a telephone number of Levering 3100. And that happens to be the number of the telephone Mr. Passmore's home. You mean that somebody called from here? On this telephone, yes, ma'am. Oakdale 623, that's the number of your telephone here, isn't it? Yes, it's our number. Yes, it's what I've got here. Well, I can't imagine who it'd be that called. Port says it was a woman's voice. And the call was made at uh, 5 o'clock this evening, you say, half an hour ago? 527, my report says. The operator didn't give the address, of course. It's against the telephone company's rules. It does seem strange, doesn't it? Has this telephone here been used at all, to your knowledge, Mrs. Craig, since 5 o'clock this afternoon? 
Why, um, I answered a call a few minutes ago from Northampton, Massachusetts. A long-distance call, you mean? Yes. It was a Mr. Fredericks at Smith College there calling my cousin to inquire about her mother. Her mother's ill in Albany. I see. You don't know whether or not anybody from the outside has been in here since five o'clock. Mm, not to my knowledge. Well, except a neighbor from across the avenue there, Mrs. Fraser. She brought some roses over to my husband's aunt. She was here when I got in, although I scarcely think she would have used the telephone. Mm, mind if I use this phone here for a minute? Oh, not at all. Go right ahead. Keelan, tell calling. That's so. I gotta wait in there before six. Right over, Chuck. I'll be right over. Won't have to bother you anymore right now, Mrs. Craig. There's been a bit of additional information coming over at headquarters that'll hold things up temporarily. And has there been some new development in the case? Yes, Mrs. Craig, a very important development. Good evening, and thank you, Mrs. Craig. Yes, yeah, very welcome. Sure. Walter, where have you been? I was very really hurt, my alliance. Shut that door. All right. Matter. Haven't you seen the evening paper of Fergus Passmore and his wife? Yes, I've seen it. Well, what about it, Walter? What about it? What do you mean? Well, I've been what? nearly out of my mind for the last half hour. I happened to see it in the paper there when I came downstairs. I, I couldn't find you anywhere. I thought probably you'd been arrested or something. What did I be arrested for, Harriet? Well, connection with this thing, of course. Police are looking for you. One of them just left here not five minutes ago. Are they looking for me? What are they looking for me for? What, doesn't it say in the paper there? You were seen leaving past Moors at 12 o'clock last night? It doesn't night? say that I was seen leaving there. It says there was a man seen leaving there. And I who know. else could it have been but you? You were out there, weren't you? Yes. Well, that's enough, isn't it? But they don't know that. Oh, don't be absurd, Walter. Didn't you tell me that Billy Burkmeyer called you on the telephone out there last night? Yes. Well, didn't the butler get your name then? Uh, no, Fergus answered the phone himself on the extension of the library. Did the policeman say they knew it was I that was out there last night? Oh, I don't remember what he said exactly. I was too upset. But he wanted to know where you were, and of course I couldn't tell him because you were here when I left the room, and then you suddenly disappeared. Yeah. I was never placed in such a position in my life. I'm sure that man must have thought I was evading him. Where did you go with Billy? Over to Fergus' house. Oh, what in heaven's name did you do a thing like that for, Walter? Do you want your name to be dragged into this thing? I should think your own common sense would show you what it would mean to have your name mentioned in an affair of this sort. I would be in every newspaper in the country. It wouldn't bother me in the least. Wouldn't bother you? No, not in the least. My conscience is clear. Oh, don't be so absurdly romantic, Walter. It isn't a question of romanticism at all, Harriet. No, and it isn't a question of conscience either. Simply a matter of discretion. If you've had nothing to do with this thing, what's the use of becoming involved? What do you mean, if I've had nothing to do with it? Oh, don't start picking me up on every word, and don't take out a cigarette. Walter, you know you can't smoke in this room. Oh, all right. Well, that's a nice place to throw it, I must say. Into the fireplace, don't you want it? What good is it if I can't smoke it? Well, there are plenty of other places in the house smoke, if you want to. I don't know where they are. Well, you can smoke in your den, can't you? If I shut the door. Oh, now, don't act martyred, Walter. I think I'll call up Billy and see if the police have been to see. You're not going to call Billy Burkmeyer. Why not? Don't you realize that that telephone is being watched and that they are probably watching Burke Myers, too? And if you call him and the operator listened in... She's got something else to do but listen in on our calls, Harry. Well, Believe she listened me. in on this one, didn't she? Which one? Huh? Uh, what did you say? You mean the police said the operator had reported on a call from here? Oh, I don't remember what he said distinctly. He just kept rambling on about a telephone. Well, I want to know why our phone's being watched. That's more I intend to find out. Now, listen to me, Walter Craig. You must not use that telephone... I will not allow you to drag my name into a notorious oh, scandal. Harriet, I've got to find out where I'm at at this thing. If you speak over that telephone, I'll leave the house. And you know what construction would be put upon that under the circumstances. What do you mean? You leave the house. I mean exactly what I said. Do you think I could stay in this neighborhood 24 hours after my name had been associated with a thing of this kind? Harriet, you surely don't believe I had anything to do with the murder. It isn't for me to determine the degree of your guilt or innocence. I'm not interested. Harriet. I'm interested only in the respect of the community we've got to live in. You mean you'd rather know I was involved in this thing and keep the respect of the community than know I was the victim of circumstances and lose it? All right, Mrs. Harold. Put it up with you. We'll be right out. Harold. Yes, sir? Miss Harold, do you know if anybody's called that number that I gave you last night here today on the telephone, Levering 3100? No, sir. You haven't had occasion to call that number today on this telephone. I never even thought about it today until Mrs. Craig asked me for it when she came in this evening, and I gave it to her. All right, Mrs. Harold. Thank you very much. And it was you that made that call. What are you doing, checking up on me? Don't flatter yourself, Walter. What you were doing, wasn't it? Why didn't you tell the truth? You were playing safe. That was it, wasn't it? Exactly. And at my expense. I knew if I told you I made that call, you'd be on the telephone in five minutes telling the police. Well, I intend doing that anyway. Well, if you do, you'll explain my leaving you, too. 
That wouldn't worry me in the least, Harry. Well, it might worry the police. But it's you the detectives are looking for, oh, Harry. you needn't try to turn it on to me. They wouldn't be looking for either of us if you'd stayed at home last night instead of being out car playing with a lot of irregular people. I felt it in my bones up there in Albany that something would happen while I was away. I knew as soon as ever my back was turned, you'd be out with your friends again. And what is your back being turned got to do with my visiting my friends? Well, you wouldn't have been visiting them if I'd been what here. What do you mean? How would you stop me? I'd have stopped you all right one way or another. What you've done, lock the door on me? Wouldn't have been necessary to lock the door on you. You haven't been visiting them in the last 18 months, have you? No, I haven't. And they haven't been visiting you either. You mean you kept them out of here? Well, if I did, the end justified the means. You at least haven't been in the shadow of the law in the last 18 months. My aunt said here a while ago she'd driven all my friends away from the house. I thought she was imagining things. Said something else, too, something I didn't believe. She said you were trying to get rid of me, too, without actually driving me away from the house. I believe that's true, too. What if I wasn't cordial to your friends? You think I wanted my house turned into a tavern? Friends never turned my mother's house into a tavern. Well, evidently, your mother and I have very different ideas of a house. Very different indeed, Harriet. There was more actual home in one room of my mother's house than there'd be in all of this if we lived in it a thousand years. Why didn't you stay in it, then, if you found it so attractive? Now you're talking, Harriet. Now you're talking. Why didn't I do just that? Don't make any mistakes that I... You didn't want my friends here simply because they played cards. You wouldn't have wanted them if they'd come here to hold prayer meetings. You didn't want them because, as my aunt says, there's it's implied an importance to me that it was at variance with your little campaign, the campaign that was to reduce me to one of the wife-ridden sheep that's afraid to buy a necktie for fear his wife might not approve of it. Oh, don't try to make yourself out a martyr. You had your share of this bargain. I never regarded this thing as a bargain. Did you expect me to go into a thing as important as marriage with my eyes shut? I wanted you to go into it honestly as I went into it 50 50. You've been playing safe right from the start. You've been exploiting me consistently in your shifty little business of personal safety. And you'd throw me right now to the suspicion of implication in this double murder to preserve that safety. I've been trying to preserve my home. That's all I've heard from you since the day I married you. Well, what else has a woman like me but her home? Hasn't she her husband? She could lose her husband, couldn't she, as many another one has. Couldn't she lose her home, too? She couldn't if she knew how to secure it. That's the point in a nutshell, Harriet. If she knew how to fix it for herself. Well, what if I have fixed things for myself? You haven't lost anything by it, have you? If I fix them for myself, I fix them for you, too. Your home is here. And maybe if I hadn't played the game so consistently, it wouldn't be here. And I wouldn't be the first woman that's lost her home and her husband, too, through letting the control of them get out of her hands. I saw what happened to my mother, and I made up my mind it would never happen to me. She was one of those... I will follow thee, my husband, women, that believed everything my father told her. And all the time he was mortgaging her home over her head for another woman. And when she found it out, she did the only thing that women like her can do. And that was to die of a broken heart within six months. Leaving the door wide open for the other woman to come in as stepmother over Estelle and me. And then get rid of us both as soon as Estelle was marriageable. But the house was never mortgaged over her head, I'll promise you that. For she saw to it that it was put in her name before ever she took him. And she kept it there, too, right to the finish. Why didn't you ask me to put this house in your name? Because I didn't want it in my name. Yeah, I've been more honest. I haven't done anything that wasn't honest. Simply tried to be practical, but with your usual romanticism, you want to make me appear a criminal for it. I'm not reproaching you at all, Harriet. I'm merely saying that you simply married the wrong man. I married a romantic fool. That's what I married. I'm seeing it more clearly every day I live. Oh, well, we understand each other now. Right. Do we? Huh? Walter. Now, who on earth moves those ornaments on the mantelpiece? Grass of you. Presumption. Just wondering how you get that way. Walter, did you move those ornaments? So brazenly presumptuous as to say such a thing to me. What have you ever done for a million others like you that would warrant the assumption of such superiority over the men you're married. I asked the servants a dozen times not to touch the things on the mantelpiece. You should set yourself up to control the very destiny of a man as though I were some mental incompetent. I... Uh, uh, sorry, ma'am, but I had to remind you about dinner. It's going to be spoiled. Oh, Mrs. Harold, who moved those ornaments? I only dusted them, ma'am. You know perfectly well I never allow anybody even to dust that mantelpiece but myself. 
I even bought a special little brush for those ornaments because I wouldn't trust them to anybody else. But you were away, Mrs. Craig. I am not interested in your excuses. I have told you over and over again never touch those ornaments, and you deliberately disobey me. I'm sorry, Mrs. Craig. Well, don't let it happen again. You may put up the dinner. We'll begin in two minutes. Yes, Mrs. Craig. Walter, you better go along in and get your dinner before it's cold. I'll go up and tell Ethel and Auntie Austin. Did something get broken here, Mr. Craig? Did that ornament fall off the mantelpiece? No, Mrs. Harold. I smashed it. On purpose, do you mean, Mr. Craig? Yes. I didn't like it. Walter! Did something fall down there a moment ago? No. Wait. Sounded up here as though the house fell down. Maybe it did, Harriet. I'm just standing here, wondering. Is the yellow cab company? Oh, will you send a cab to 8545 Franklin Avenue? At once, please. Thank you. What on earth is going on down there this morning? Zarrow? Is the men taking out Miss Austin's truck, Mrs. Craig? Well, tell them to keep it away from the wall. I don't want that wall all scratched up. I only had it painted in April. Yes, ma'am, I'll tell them. Are you up, Walter? Yes. Good heavens, Walter. What a mess your room is, honestly. Oh, is that the morning paper? What does it say about the past morning? Quite safe. Quite safe. His brother got in last night in Pittsburgh with a letter that Fergus had written him intimating his intention. Ah, then Fergus did it himself. So it appears. I was told he was jealous of his wife. He did it because she was dishonored. Well, thank heaven I kept my head last night and didn't allow you to telephone and make a show of us all. You can thank me that your name isn't in every paper in the city this morning. Oh, I can thank you for more than that, Harris. Another thing. I want to know about that ornament there that was broken downstairs last night. I smashed it. Oh, what were you doing? Leaning against the mantelpiece again as usual? No, it wasn't an accident. I did it deliberately. What do you mean, you did it deliberately? I mean that I smashed it purposely. What for? I became suddenly heroic. I smashed it into a thousand little pieces. Then I smoked one cigarette after another till I had your sanctum sanctorum absolutely littered with ashes and cigarette butts. I was positively a whale of a fellow around here for about an hour last night. Should have seen. What did you do? Go out of your mind or something? No, it's particularly clear in my mind, strange to say. You made a remark here last night, Harriet, that completely illuminated me and uh, illuminated you. Suddenly I saw for the first time everything. Just as one sees an entire landscape at midnight in a flash of lightning. But unfortunately, the lightning struck my house and knocked it down. I sat here all night wondering how I might build it up again. Oh, really, and I Walter. saw your entire plan of life, Harriet, and its relationship to me. And my instinct of self-preservation suggested the need of immediate action. At the inauguration of a new regime here, so I smashed your little ornament as a kind of opening gun. I was going to smash all the other little ornaments and gods you'd set up a temple here and been worshipping before me. I was going to put my house in order, including my wife, and rule it with a rod of iron. <laughs> I don't wonder that amuses you. It amused me. Particularly when I suddenly remember the truth of what you called me last night. In view of that, the absurdity of my trying to sustain such a role indefinitely made me laugh, but I'm rather sorry you couldn't have seen me anyway. I think you would at least have appreciated the sincerity of my attempt to continue here as your husband. Oh, you mean attempt to continue here as my husband? I realize now, Harriet, that the role is not for me. I can only play a romantic part. Ethel, dear Tyler, what are you doing up so early? You're not ill, are you, dear? No, but I've made up my mind, Aunt Harriet. I've got to go to Auburn, and I know, dear child, but I'm sure you're upsetting yourself unnecessarily. We certainly would have heard something if anything had happened. And I really should call Mr. Fredericks on the long distance, Aunt Harriet. He'll be wondering what on earth has happened. He probably hasn't given it a thought. Oh, don't say that, Aunt Harriet. I know he hasn't. Mrs. Gray. Well, Mrs. Harold, what are you doing with your hat on at this hour? Where are you going? Well, the fact is, I, I'm i leaving, Mrs. Craig. Leaving? I'm going with Miss Austin, Mrs. Craig. Indeed. She was telling me last night she was going to leave here, and I said I thought I'd be leaving pretty soon myself. 
So she said if I was going away soon, she'd like very much to have me go with her. And do you think it's very considerate of you, Mrs. Harold, to walk away like this without giving me any notice? What about the keys? I left them all on your dressing table upstairs, and Miss Austin's, too. Well, I'd better check things over with you first, Mrs. Harold. We'll see who's at the door, will you, Ethel? And whoever it is, neither Mr. Craig nor I are at home. Uh, come on upstairs, Mrs. Harold. Jean! Ethel. Oh, Jean, what are you doing here? I had to see you, darling. I thought maybe you were ill or something. I called you on the long distance, but I couldn't get any satisfaction. I, I didn't know what to think. I just jumped on the night train and got in here at 8.20. I'm going right... I'm going home right away, Jean. Did your cousin tell you I called you last night? Why? No, she didn't. Well, I, I asked her to call you to the phone. She didn't seem to want to do it. In fact, I, she hung up on me. That's why I came down. It seems such a peculiar thing to do in the long distance. I know why she didn't tell me you called. Well, she doesn't want me to marry you. Jean, do you really want to marry me very much? Why, yes. More than anything in the world, I... Well, yesterday she almost convinced me that I was wrong about loving you. But today I know differently. If you're ready, Jean, we'll go. Uncle Walter will drive us to the station. We'll wait for him on the porch. I don't want to see Aunt Harriet again. Ethel, you and Mrs. Mrs. Frederick get in the car. I'll be right out as soon as I can get in. All right, Uncle Walter. Harriet? Going out? What is it, Walter? I'm meeting Andy Austin in town... On the way, I'll take Ethel and Fricks down to the station. Is Ethel leaving without telling me goodbye? Do you wonder after what you did to her? Well, just because I... Walter, don't put those keys on that table. You scratch... the key to your car in the garage. There's some other things I've left for you. If you'd want me for anything during the week, I'll be at the Ritz. You'll be... Where? Walter, you're not serious about leaving this house. I think that decision would please you very much. Well, it doesn't please me at all. It's absolutely ridiculous. But it's so absolutely practical. Oh, don't try to be funny, Walter. Anyway, I'd like to know what's practical about a man walking out and leaving his heart, wife and his home. I have no wife to leave. You neither loved nor honored me. Well, you married me, whether I did or not. I never saw you before in my life, Harriet, till last night. Well, you married me, didn't you? And you married a house. If it's agreeable to you, I'll see that you have it all to yourself. You'll be quite alone with your house. Oh, you'll be back unless I'm very much mistaken. You don't know your man, Harriet. You know me pretty well, I'll grant you that, particularly when you said my mind worked very slowly. You fail to reckon with the thoroughness of my mind when it does work. We've shown our hands, Harriet. The game's up. But you also showed me how I could keep from making a fool of myself in the future. Well, you're certainly not beginning very auspiciously, I can tell you that. I shall be at least a self-respecting fool, and that's something I could never be if I stayed here. Harriet, there's something in a man that I suppose is... his essential manhood... You insulted that last night. I should be too embarrassed here under your eye, knowing that you had no respect for that manhood. I should remember my lover's ardors and enthusiasms for our future, and you bearing with me contemptuously for the sake of your future. I couldn't stand it. Where are you going when you leave here? Where a lot like me are going. Out fashion, possibly. You know, Harriet, I can't help but wonder, with all your wisdom, it never occurred to you that one can't play a dishonest game indefinitely. I haven't played any dishonest game. Maybe not according to your standards, but I think you have, and I think you know you have. That's the rock that you and I are splitting on. This fair at Passmore's hadn't revealed you something else would. So my going may as well be today as tomorrow. Goodbye, Harriet. <laughs> 